Uh, thanks, everyone, for attending our talk on Crossplane and Argo CD. Uh, my name is Jesse Suen. I'm one of the co-creators of the Argo project and co-founder of a company called Acuity, which offers fully managed Argo CD in the cloud. And speaking with me today is Victor, who you probably already know from his very popular YouTube channel. Okay. And Victor. Yeah, so my name is Victor. I work for a uh, company behind Crossplane. And uh, it's, this is a bit difficult subject because we're talking about tips and trips. How many of you are using Crossplane today? The rest of you might have trouble to follow up. This is going into, into all the troubles that this guy <laughs> was facing with Crosspoint. Anyways, so well, let me give you a very quick introduction, very, very quick introduction into, um, in, into Crosspoint, right? And uh, I'm going to show it in a way from, from the point of uh, view of history, right? Uh, at the very beginning, uh, we got configurations, uh, configuration uh, man management tools, Chef, Puppet, Ansible, you know, all those things. Some of you are probably using Ansible still. And they were all based on the idea that things are mutable, right? I know that they can do immutable things, but based on mutable principles, uh, you can call that the first generation, what later on became infrastructure as code. Uh, and they were, they were mostly based for bare metal, you know, real servers, you know, before virtual machines and before cloud and all those things. And then we got into the second generation of, of such tools, we call that second generation if, uh, infrastructure as code, as code, with Terraform, Pulumi, CloudFormation, all the good stuff that many of you are probably using, right? Now, what is happening right now uh, with, uh, with the emergence of Kubernetes is that we are moving into the next phase, and that, that next phase is using Kubernetes as a control plane, right? Using Kubernetes with all the good things that we, you all, how many of you are not using Kubernetes? <laughs> okay, I'm just checking. Uh, with all the good things and all the things you like, right? Now, extensible APIs, custom resource definitions, drift detection, reconciliation, and all the, all the stuff that we like, right? And the whole idea is that uh, thinking of Kubernetes as something that runs containers is wrong, right? That, that containers are just one of the implementations of Kubernetes scheduler, and we have many, many, many others. And one of those others is crossplane. So what we're trying to do with crossplane can be uh, described uh, through two, two main areas, right? One area would be one-to-one -one matching between resources in Kubernetes or custom resource definitions and something on the other end, right? So if you need, if, if on the other end you have EC2 instances in AWS, then you have a custom resource that you can apply in your Kubernetes and use all the good things that we like with Kubernetes to manage the EC2 instance, or whatever else that is, right? Ordering pizzas, it's up to you. I mean, depends on the providers. Now, the second and equally important or more important part about Crossplane is the ability to create compositions, right? Compositions are a way for you to create your own custom resource definitions with controllers that define what something means to you, right? What does it mean to you to have a cluster? to have uh, an application, to have a database, right? What does it involve? And as such, when you combine all those things, you can expose through those custom resources uh, uh, your work, your operational knowledge to everybody else in your company. But as effectively, we are through compositions enabling you uh, to create your own internal developer platforms and provide services to application developers, testers, or whomever else is working with you, right? Uh, instead of waiting for somebody to open a Jira ticket, right? I'll ask how many of you like Jira tickets? <laughs> okay, cool, cool. Good audience. Uh, uh, with that in mind, I'm going to uh, leave it to Jesse uh, because he's been working with Crossplane and Argo for a while and has some really good insights. Yeah, thanks, Victor. Uh, so today I'll be covering how uh, Acuity uses Crossplane and some lessons uh, and learnings based on our experience with it. Um, so let me start by uh, explaining like why we chose Crossplane. Uh, so the main reason we wanted Crossplane was we wanted to manage our infrastructure the, the same way that we manage our applications, and that's using things like Argo CD and, and GitOps. Um, so we wanted to apply the same tooling, the practices and processes uh, to our infrastructure, especially when we want to encourage a, you know, these DevOps 
based workflows. So these days, the, the line between your infrastructure and your applications are getting more and more blurry. And so there's a lot of this coordination that needs to happen between your cloud resources and your Kubernetes resources. Um, and the best example of this is things like IAM. So Amazon has IRSA, and, and Google has something called uh, workload identities. And even though you know, we're a, a small team and we don't really have like a separate you know, platform engineering team, uh, we still wanted to provide the, this simple interface uh, to developers to basically lay the groundwork for scaling up, providing standardized self-service um, infrastructure, and just exposing a, a much more simpler set of knobs. And, and this enables us to treat our infrastructure more like cattle, so not, it's not like a big deal to you know, create more and more of these things. So Crossplane enables just um, you know, treating these things like, like cattle. So these are the type of resources that we deploy today using Crossplane. Um, we're primarily AWS shop, and we only use uh, three Crossplane providers. Uh, the AWS provider, Helm provider, and the Kubernetes provider. Um, we do have a presence on GCP, but it's quite small, and, and currently they're not uh, managed by Crossplane. But I think in the future that could change, and um, we'll be you know, pretty prepared to use Crossplane for both managing GCP stuff as well as AWS. So Probably the most powerful feature that you want to be using Crossplane for is its ability to compose resources into higher level resources, um, what they call compositions. Um, and here are the, uh, some of the compositions that we created for our own internal purposes. Um, and so we started with Upbound's uh, reference architecture. So they publish a bunch of reference implementations for um, AWS or GCP, Azure. Um, and then we tweaked it uh, a bunch of things to kind of suit our own needs. For example, we, we changed it to run in three availability zones instead of two. We enabled KMS secrets encryption. Um, we added uh, the AWS add-ons. And then we also did something, um, created our own add-ons, which I'll explain um, in a little bit. But if you're looking to get started, I highly suggest um, using those reference implementations as a good starting point on modeling your um, your compositions. Um, and also, there's this, you'll see this one composition up there called the IRSA re, um, composition. And that's specifically to handle uh, IAM roles and policies associated with Kubernetes service accounts. And I'll, I'll get to why that's needed in a bit. So, and along with those compute and networking compositions, uh, we also have this concept of a add-on composition uh, for Kubernetes clusters. Um, here I'm showing six such add-ons, and each add-on is different from the other. So, whoa. So one example is, um, you know, the one will require different policies, um, and so their uh, their policy manifest will be different. Some is installed using Helm. The others are. Uh, just installed through raw Kubernetes manifest. And so um, you can see which of these um, lower level objects are composed into this higher level um, composition. And so just to give you an idea of what one of the add-ons looks like, here's the spec for our Carpenter add-on. Um, if you're not familiar with Carpenter, it's, um, it's basically a better version of cluster autoscaler, um, primarily for AWS. But so in this spec, you can see we just expose a few of the Carpenter parameters that we're interested in. Um, and if, so looking at this example, this cluster will want to use spot instances, um, and it wants to only use these four instant classes, and uh, it will have like a max auto scaling of 100 vCPUs. Um, so all of these values will get passed all the way down to the Carpenter um, you know, config map or provide, um, provisioner, but how that happens is, is abstracted away from uh, the user deploying this. Uh, and this, this is just an illustration of how this nesting of composition works. Um, so you can see here we have this 
the top level EKS composition, and in, inside that you have you know things your normal managed resources like cluster, node groups, or they see provider. Um, but then you can include your um, your own self written compositions like my Carpenter add-on that's composed of like a Helm release and instance profile provisioner. And then that thing um, encompasses another um, composition we wrote, the IRSA one, um, and inside that is your, your policy, your role, and your role policy attachment. Um, so let's uh, talk about one of, I think, probably one of my biggest annoyances about how privileges are handled in AWS. So AWS has this feature where you can give your pods IAM privileges um, without using long-lived static credentials. Um, and they call it IRSA, I guess it's called IAM roles for service accounts. Um, Google has their own version of it called workload identity, and they, they work basically the same way. Um, so the way it works is you have your, you know, your normal IAM policy and your IAM role, and they're like attached to each other. And to give IAM privileges to a pod, it has to go through uh, an OIDC provider, which you, uh, which you create along with your cluster. Then you need to reference this OIDC provider in like two different places in that IAM role. And then you have your service account. Um, the service account is the one that you want to give privileges to your cloud. Um, and this server account has to have an annotation um, which references the ARN of the uh, IAM role, which we want to impersonate. And then that IAM role wants, uh, should then have a reference back to the service account so this um, bi-directional trust is established. Um, so this, this is a really pain to manage, but um, uh, we use Crossplane to kind of help coordinate and manage all these references. Uh, so to simplify things, we, we have another, this composition which we call an IRSA. And this IRSA resource accepts all of those previous uh, things that I talked about as inputs. So like what service account um, the name you want to give permissions to, the namespace it lives in, the OIDC of the cluster um, that it, that's, that namespace and service account is, and then the IAM policy, the um, uh, permissions uh, that it uh, wants. And so what the IRSA object does is uh, it, then it creates the underlying AWS managed resources with all of those um, references and back references in place where they need to be. And so the end result is that we just have to create this one IRSA object and then the composition kind of takes care of all these child resources and cross-referencing. Um, so th this slide is just showing the fact that we also use Crossplane to deploy uh, managed resources directly. And managed resources are kind of like the lowest level uh, provider resources that um, have, have like a one-to-one -one mapping with the uh, cloud provider. Um, so there's going to be a lot of times where you just want to create you know, cloud resources not tied to any other objects. In our case, we want to create you know, Route 53 entries or um, uh, routes, transit gateways, or maybe we just want to create a, like a bespoke IAM role to give to one of our, our services. Um, and uh, so the, this, the example that we use it for is, uh, let's say you, have, you create two VPC networks. In our case, like it's an EKS VPC and then a database VPC. And then later on, we want to connect those two. So then we'll use Crossplane to deploy the transit gateway and then the attachments to connect those two VPCs. Um, so you might be wondering, OK, where does Argo CD come into the picture? So far, I've been talking about add-ons and, and how we use Crossplane to install those. But what about Argo CD? And the answer is we actually use both. So, and there's some trade-offs that you should understand when you decide you want Crossplane to install uh, something through a Helm chart, or you, when you want Argo CD to do um, something. So the advantages of using Crossplane uh, to to have like an add-on installed af, um, as part of a cluster object um, is that you know everything is handled in that composition. So you just basically apply that one top-level EKS object, and then 20 minutes later, you have a fully functional cluster. It has all the add-ons it needs. 
and it's ready to use out of the gate. Um, and this includes things like um, I am privileges to the, the, con the controllers that need it. Um, but um, uh, the flip side is that these add-on versions are, are more cumbersome to manage. So they're, they're tied to your EKS composition that you wrote. And so let's say tomorrow you want to upgrade AWS Load Balancer, you have to kind of modify your composition to get the new Helm chart version and then publish that, um, that new composition. Um, and so uh, the, the upgrade process of that add-on is much more uh, tedious. Also, if it's part of that composition, it also means that like all the clusters that are, the, um, that are created from that composition, they all get the same version. And so you don't have that flexibility of you know, maybe picking different versions for different clusters. They, uh, they're all kind of tied to what you chose in, in your uh, composition. Um, on the Argo CD side, the best benefit you get is you can use a GitOps-based workflow for, for managing your add-on. So this means you can control the versions for different environments. Um, you use you know, GitOps to modify the config map um, uh, used by those add-ons. Um, and unlike a composition, you actually get to choose like, which add-ons get to be deployed in the cluster. So uh, with a composition, you're basically deciding like, you know, these end um, add-ons are part of it. And there's no way to kind of turn off and on. It's just like, um, it's an all or nothing kind of decision. Um, uh, some of the drawbacks of you know, Argo's CD using to deploy is it can't um, do this coordination of uh, and referencing passing of, of like IAM to all the resources. So um, that's a, a one limitation of Argo CD. And second, if you're using Argo CD to um, manage uh, your add-ons, it's, it's going to be like the second step, you know, you create your cluster first and then followed by, you know, installing uh, some cluster add-on. Uh, so, so we, I mentioned we use both, and so we decide uh, a different strategy depending on the type of add-on. And so there's three different kinds. So the first is what I call like critical add-ons. These are add-ons that are kind of essential for a cluster to function. Uh, for example, without auto-scaling, you can't even probably install more add-ons because the cluster doesn't have capacity to automatically scale up as you, you know, throw more pods up at it. Um, and so for these critical add-ons, we basically bundle it as part of the, um, the EKS composition that we wrote, and, and we consider it just, you know, part of the distribution. Um, so then next, uh, is what I call the like, IAM only add-ons. And so these add-ons are ones that need some coordination with AWS resources, namely IAM, um, and, and they need to do that, that whole cross-referencing stuff that I, I showed in that previous slide. Um, and these are also things I consider optional. Like, I don't need certain manager in every cluster or, um, and, and, or external DNS, right? So, uh, so what we do with this is that we use Crossplane to install just the IAM portions of it. And if we do want the actual controller running in the cluster, we'll follow it up by um, uh, in, in using Argo CD and install it. And then by then, the, um, you know, the services account is already uh, pre-created for them and, and we don't have to uh, deploy, uh, do anything in the cloud. And finally, we have the, the other stuff. And so these add-ons have no dependency to AWS, and, and we just treat them kind of like normal applications fully managed by Argo CD. Um, here are some examples of some add-ons in each category. And currently, the only three that we consider critical um, and that belong in every cluster are uh, Carpenter for auto-scaling, the AWS Load Balancer controller, and external secrets. So every cluster um, that we provision will get those three as a default. Um, and then we have these add-ons, which um, maybe the cluster will, you know, might need. And so uh, for those, like that external, external DNS, uh, cert manager, ADOT, those all kind of require some AWS privilege. And so um, we'll kind of pre-create those policies for them, but not, not the actual 
um, uh, the workload objects uh, because that is followed that is handled by Argo CD. Uh, and then finally, that last column are the example of, of cluster add-ons which have no tie into AWS and can be managed like a normal uh, Kubernetes application. Uh, next, I want to talk about what we feel is a best practice for using Crossplane. Uh, one issue you might face is that when you release a new composition or update a provider, it, it could be risky because you know when you're updating those things, all instances of that composition get updated at the same time. And so it could mean that you break all your clusters at the same time. Um, so what we do is we run multiple cross planes, one per environment, so test, stage, prod. And then we progressively promote a composition um, through the environments just so we can control the blast radius if, if something goes wrong. And here's an illustration of this. Um, so here we have three, those three environments. So, or AWS accounts, and you can see a, there's a cross plane in each account to manage the infrastructure of that account. Um, and when we roll out a new version of our composition, uh, then it first goes to test and stage and prod. Um, and meanwhile, Argo CD is um, deploying to all the clusters that you see in this uh, picture. Okay, um, so I'll go over some kind of tips and tricks. Uh, specifically with using Argo CD and Crossplane, because there's um, definitely some things you should turn on and off uh, when you're using Argo CD and Crossplane. So probably the most important tip I can give is, is this Argo CD feature called um, annotation tracking, which is not the default, by the way. Um, it probably will be the default in the future, but as of now, it's not on. Um, so if you've been using Argo CD and Crossplane, one thing you might notice is that um, Argo CD has a is pruning feature, and it wants to delete resources which think it, um, you know, are no longer managed in Git. And it does it by seeing the live object and looking at a label and says, oh, that label was tied to this application, but it's missing from Git, therefore I should prune it. Um, the thing is, Crossplane kind of carries over um, that label that you apply in your, um, your, your claims resource to the com uh, composite resource, which is, is kind of like a child of the, the claim. And so because of that, if you're using label-based tracking, Argo C turns around and says, oh, I better go delete it. It must be something they removed from Git. So what annotation-based tracking does is we, we, instead of labeling it with a simple name, we annotate it with a lot of metadata. Um, and based on that metadata, we can, um, we understand if something was a label or, or annotation was just carried over from some parent object, and we will decide not to prune it. Um, so this is a feature you definitely want to turn on. Even if you're not using Crossplane, this is a better way um, to uh, use Argo CD. And it, it will be the default. Um, in the future, I'm sure. Hmm? Yeah. You want to speak, you said? No, no, I said next week. Oh, next week. I thought you said, I thought you, said you wanted to speak. <laughs> okay. Um, where are we? Okay, so, um, some performance tricks. Um, one thing to know about Crossplane is it, it can install like hundreds of CRDs, and you're probably not going to be using most of them. Um, the problem that happens is Argo CD wants to list and watch those, uh, those resources, even if you're not using them, um, because you might be using them and it needs to discover them. So this causes um, you know, a lot of memory pressure on both the car app controller of Argo CD as well as the Kubernetes API server. And, and this is just kind of an illustration of you know, what's happening. Um, so Argo CD has a feature called resource exclusions. Um, and the idea is that you can basically tell Argo CD to, to pretend like these resources don't exist. Um, and how this helps is that uh, if, they, if Argo CD doesn't know they exist, it won't actually monitor those, and, and which lowers the number of connections and, and pressure to the controller. Um, another use of resource exclusions, um, and this kind of improves the usability of the user interface, um, is something called um, Crossplane has this object called a provider config usage, and for the most part, it's an implementation detail of Crossplane. You don't, you don't ever manage those objects, and you 
probably shouldn't ever care that they exist. But the problem is they actually show up in the Argo CD UI because they, they're, they're, they're always children of um, the low level of managed resource. And so um, one thing to kind of just declutter the Argo CD UI is just to also ignore these type of resources. And then you'll basically reduce your, your resource tree by one whole um, level. Another problem uh, with high number of CRDs is um, it makes something called API discovery pretty slow. So you might actually notice this from like kubectl itself. Like Kube, kubectl has to kind of ask Kubernetes about like, hey, what, do you, what kind of CRDs do you have in the system? If you have hundreds of these things, it's actually um, can get slow. Um, Argo CD does the same discovery, but um, right now there's like this bug or, or performance problem which um, makes it inefficient. Um, so you can work around this problem by just bumping up the uh, QPS, which we're currently getting throttled on, uh, to the controller. Um, and this should be a temporary workaround that you don't need in the future. Um, health checks. OK, so if, um, if you don't know, Crosspoint has very uh, homogeneous statuses for all of the resources it creates. Um, so they all get this um, condition, like is the resource synced or is it ready? Um, and so it's, uh, Argo CD has this feature which lets you write a, a snippet of Lua script and evaluate the, the object to see if there's um, any, uh, to return if it's healthy or degraded or progressing. And so, Here's this uh, a simple resource help check that you can write for that um, DB instance that I, I showed in the previous slide. And this, as you can see, it just iterates the conditions, see if it's not synced, and then if it isn't, it'll show, uh, cause the resource to show up as degraded. And then um, you can see in this little screenshot, it will actually get surfaced to the Argo CD UI, uh, and you can quickly identify um, problems in your cross-plane resources and, and get a, a lot better visibility. OK, um, some challenges we faced. Um, one thing is if you want Crossplane to adopt existing resources, um, it could be challenging, especially for AWS. Um, and this is because uh, AWS has this, this behavior where it just generates like random IDs for, for some things like VPCs, subnets, and security groups. Um, and Crossplane, um, when when you recreate um, a resource, let's say you um, wanted to take over an existing one, or maybe you're just moving your, um, you know, migrating to a different cross-plane cluster. So when you apply it a second time, it doesn't know that existing one um, already exists and it should adopt it. Um, so now you're left with like two VPCs. There's, um, you know, ways around this. You can annotate your resources in, uh, with an external name so that you can take it over. Um, but this kind of breaks the whole, you know, GitOps user experience because now you're kind of incorporating IDs in your um, manifest when you, you didn't have to originally. Um, but one tip you should practice, and I recommend, is um, to use formulated names for your composite XR resources, um, and instead of using relying on generate name for it, um, and that way you're. AWS resources get kind of human readable names. Um, some things I, I um, limitations in crossplane, but I think they're you know being worked on and be addressed in the future. As of now, a composition um, you can't conditionally create resources depending on like um, like input parameters. So for example, for us, like I would love the ability to enable or disable. Um, a cluster add-on based on like some um, true/false values in the parameters. Um, another example is like we might have a dev version of a database that has more instances versus a prod instance. Um, so today we resort to scripting and code generation to kind of um, to create two versions of the composition that are are slightly different. And um, another limitation is uh, we. Crossplane doesn't have an ability to reference uh, another resource and get status information to feed into the input of the current resource. So 
if, if you're currently working all within the same composition, it's, it's fine because it's, um, uh, all the references happen in the same YAML. But if you want a kind of a more loosely coupled uh, process, so maybe you have an EKS network, uh, e another EKS network, and you want to attach them, today uh, what you have to do is copy the VPC ID, um, paste it into that transit gateway to connect them, um, and and then, and then now they're connected. So it would be great if we could have something where I can just reference those other two things rather than copying around Amazon IDs. Um, so, so far we've been running Crossplane for the better part of a year and it's been working great for us. These are improvements that um, uh, we wanna make internally. Uh, these are not um, things about Crossplane. So currently our, we run like an EKS dedicated EKS cluster as a cross-plane control plane. Um, and so the more environments we have, like then it becomes more expensive because uh, you're kind of dedicating an EKS cluster for this. So um, it should be possible, or I, I know it's possible to just run cross-plane in you know, a smaller cluster like a, like a K3S cluster, which in that K3S cluster can run in, in a real EKS cluster. And so now we can reduce our footprint um, to just one EKS instead of like three or four. Okay, um, so that's all uh, kind of our learnings and experience with Crossplane. So I think we have some more have time for questions. Few minutes for questions, yes. About Crossplane or Argo CD yeah. or anything else. We've got time for a couple of questions. If you put your hands up, I see one there. With uh, composition uh, revision arriving uh, soon in Crossplane, do you think you are going to keep a separate instance of Crossplane to test uh, between sorry. environments? Can, can oh, you, so, uh, sorry. Try that. With composition revision arriving Crossplane soon, uh, it's a feature flag today. Do you think you're going to keep the multiple instance of Crossplane to stage to test for each environment, or you're going to have all? The I'm not sure yet. It's too early for me to reveal. Uh, still going left to right. Ask me again in a couple of weeks. Thank you. Uh, please come to the front if there are more questions. I think it's pretty difficult to hear. So, Anybody uh, else? No? Should we thank our speakers? Thank you. Yeah, thank you for coming. Yeah.